And we're studying the book of Ephesians. And right now we're looking at Ephesians chapter 1, starting in verse 17. So Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17. Keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, who gave you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That same power. The power is the same power that, oops, sorry. Okay, that power is the same as the mighty power that he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything in the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Amen. Wonderful words, very deep. A lot of things that we can take but I want us to focus on one thing in particular today. So I'm going to repeat Ephesians chapter 1 verse 17, where Paul tells us this, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation that you may know him better. And you may know him better. I have this quote. Most of the important things in life have been accomplished by those who keep on asking, seeking, knocking, and trying even when there seems no hope at all. Did you get that? That's what we're looking at today. And in looking at uh, that, I want us also to consider the words that we read from Jesus in chapter 7 of Matthew, where he states this. He says, keep on asking, and it will be given to you. Keep on seeking, and you will find. Keep on knocking, and it will be be open to you. For everyone that asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be open. Very important words for us to ponder and consider. And sometimes we may wonder, why is it? Why do we have to keep asking God over and over again the same thing? Now the response to that comes in several forms, and I'm going to start with this here. John Maxwell wrote a book called The Sixteen Laws of Communication. Chapter 4 of that book is entitled, Know Your Audience. Know Your Audience. It's really important for good communicators to know their audience, to know who they're speaking to. I have a friend who does teaching with diesel mechanics. Let me tell you, there is a difference in teaching people who are diesel mechanics than people who usually come to a church on Sunday morning. There's a big difference. And when I talked to him about that, I said to him, know your audience. We used to speak in a downtown church in Vancouver, the downtown east side. 
most of the people who came to the church were homeless people. Let me tell you this. We had invited a few people to come and speak. The first thing I said is, know your audience. You have to connect with them. It's the same thing in prayer. Know your audience. Who are you connecting with? Who is God? What is he like? Is God, for example, the kind of God that you have to implore, that you have to push, that he's the heart of hearing? Is that why you have to repeat yourself? It's important to know who you're talking to. I'd like to give you this illustration. I always love this illustration. I remember many years ago. Does anybody remember a book that was written by an individual called Maria Van Trapp? Maria Van Trapp. Yeah. She wrote a book back in 1956, and it was an autobiography. It was about her life with her husband and his children. And it was released in 1956 in German. It was very popular in Germany and in Austria. In 1959, Hollywood saw, read the book, and they said, we want to produce a movie around this book. And so they produced a movie, and it was called what? Sound of Music. Sound of Music. Now let me tell you a funny story. I have a pastor friend uh, who's now retired, and he told me a number of years ago, he risked the wrath of his future mother-in-law in the 1960s when he took his bride-to-be to a movie. Now, you wouldn't really understand and relate to that today, but back in those days, going to a movie was not the thing that you did if you went to church. And he took his fiance to see the movie, The Sound of Music. <laughs> and he said after, um, he finally got the courage to tell his uh, mother-in-law, and she said, oh, I'd like to see that too. <laughs> we were at a meeting once, and there was a missionary who was invited to speak at the meeting. And the meeting, in the meeting, the congregation, the audience, were European, French, from Belgium, from Italy, and from Africa. The message that the missionary was giving was a beautiful message, and it really touched our heart. But there was a problem. He had chosen a main point to illustrate his message. And he used for the illustrations of his message the movie, The Sound of Music. Now remember, The Sound of Music was written in German, and so German people would know the story. It was then produced in English, and so the English people would know of the movie. But these were people from France and Italy and Belgium and the Congo and Zaire. And when he was trying to illustrate the points of his message with the movie, everybody was dumbfounded. They couldn't believe what he was talking about. They couldn't understand it. And so he eventually turned to the interpreter and he said, you know the movie, The Sound of Music? And he went, no. And right then and there, Judy and I know that, knew that it was completely lost and that nobody was going to understand what he was talking about. Why is that? Because he didn't know his audience. So what kind of God are we talking with? Why do we have to keep asking God the same thing over and over again? Is God reluctant to give to us? Does he resent every imposition upon him? <clears throat> do we have to squeeze or pressure him into doing stuff to help us? Or perhaps God is like a, a doting grandfather who will just lavish gifts on their grandchildren with no consideration of the negative impact. <laughs> Understand who God is. Understand who he is talking to. And why the reason he asks us to implore him, to talk to him over and over again about the same thing. When Jesus told the people 
to keep asking and to keep seeking and to keep knocking. He gave him this illustration. And Peter, I mean, Jesus, like Paul, is very intentional. And so his illustration was well given to the, his audience, to his people. And he says to them this, he says, you parents, if your children ask for a loaf of bread, do you give them a stone instead? Now it's quite possible that he was uh, talking about a sea. And if you know by the sea, you would see a lot of smooth rocks, right? They're, they're continually washed over by the waves and they're smooth. And limestone is very pliable and so limestone would smooth it out. And it's possible that he would even pick up a rock that had been smoothed over by the waves. And it would resemble a loaf of bread to them. And he'd say, you parents, if your children ask for a loaf of bread, would you give them a stone? And of course they'd look and they'd go, well, of course not, we wouldn't do something like that. And then he says, if, you, if they ask for a fish, you know, there could be fish by, because there's fish in the ground. Would you give them a snake? Understanding that the snake to a Jewish person is one of the worst creatures that you can consider of. Would you give them something evil? Of course not, he says. So then he turns to them, and remember, he's talking to the Jewish people, he's talking to the rabbis, he's talking to the religious leaders. And he says, you, if you are, you who are sinful people, Know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask Him? And remember, like I said, He's gearing it towards His audience. And He knows that these are people who would love their children, would love their family, and would want to provide for their needs. Not to mock their needs, but to provide for their needs. And He says, if you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask Him? God loves us. God cares for us. And He believes in us. And of course He's going to provide the best for us. But why do we have to keep asking? And, and Paul also, or Peter, also repeats this teaching to the Ephesians, and he's teaching it now to the Greek. And the Greeks would understand it too, because you see, in their legends and their stories of their little deities, they would understand that if you ask one of their deities for help, then the answer could come with a bar. You know what I mean? With a bar, a hook. If you go fishing, you are giving the fish a tasty morsel. We put a minnow on a what? A hook. There's a catch involved. You can have this, but I got you after. Get the point? And that's what the Greek gods were like. Let me illustrate this. I'll give you the story. In the Greek legends, there's the, the goddess of the dog, whose name is Aurora. And according to the legend, she falls in love with a mortal young man by the name of Tithonus. And so, as the legend states, she goes to the, the head deity, which is Zeus, and she asks Zeus, will you do me a favor? Will you give me a gift? Will you bless me? I fall in love with this man. And he says, I will give you whatever you ask. So she asks Zeus, that this young man might live forever. And Zeus smiles and says, why, of course. And so, Tinnathus, or Tithonus, never dies. However, there's a bar. He never dies, but he gets older, and older, and older, and older, as Aurora stays young. He keeps getting older, but he never dies. You see, there's a bar. That's what they're like. And Zeus goes, I got you. You weren't clear in this. You said, live forever. You didn't say, live forever and stay young, did you? You see, that's what they were like. And so Paul is saying to them, God loves you. God cares for you. God wants the best for you. Keep asking. 
He's telling them that God will answer, but he'll answer in his time, in his wisdom, in his love. And what he does for us is always best. It's never going to turn out with disasters. He's going to apply his love, his understanding, and his knowledge, and his wisdom. And so he says, keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. Now what in essence he's telling us is to persist. Don't give up. There is a purpose and a reason that God asks us to keep on asking and keep on seeking and keep on praying. Let me give you the, another illustration. As a young, and I hate to admit it, but rather arrogant young man, I had received at one time when I was in a uh, performance review a near fatal blow to my weak male ego. And I like to say that because our ego, we always say we're strong, but it's, oh, never mind, I don't have to go there, you all know. In the interview, this is what I was told. I was told that I wasn't persistent and that I tend to give up on things. To which I responded silently, suffering silently, ouch, that hurts. That's not fair. That's not right. I didn't respond, but I went home feeling very upset and angry how terribly I had been mistreated and misunderstood and he didn't know me very well. And then as I thought about it, I thought he saw something in me that I, I know is true. And so a few years later, Judy and I are asked to go to Quebec and to start French ministries in this small community. And there was nothing to work with. We had no contacts, no nothing. We didn't know what to do. And we tried everything that we could possibly think of. We read books on the topic of doing missionary work. We talked to other missionaries about what they did, and we tried all sorts of things. And then we kept asking God, Again and again and again. And I was getting tired. I'm saying, what point is there in doing this? But we kept asking God and we kept trying. We kept trying different things. And for a while we were going to other churches and then we just said, well, we're going to have our own service here. Even if it's just the two of us, we're going to have prayer time together. And we're going to ask God to bless this ministry. And we had no idea how this was going to happen or what was going to go. One day we're having our quiet time in the chapel, Sunday morning, and the doors opened up and suddenly dozens of people walked in. And after I picked myself off the floor, because I was shocked, we had a nice service together. And I asked some of the people, I said, well, what brought you out? And they said, we just knew it was the thing to do today. Now, can you explain that to me? Because I haven't been able to figure that out. And from that day on, we had a congregation, and it just grew, and it kept growing and growing. Now, I like to say, read my memoirs, because you'll find out how it all happened, but it's not there. Because we didn't do anything special. But we just kept asking God, and we didn't give up. And did I get frustrated? Well, of course I got frustrated. Why aren't you, ask, why aren't you doing anything, God? We believe this is right. We know this is right. Why aren't we doing anything? But we kept on knocking. We kept on seeking. We kept on asking. And the congregation grew. But the person who grew the most is me. I'm the one who learned the most from that. I learned that you keep on asking, even when you feel like giving up, that you keep on persisting. Again, Luke this, uh, writes these words of Jesus. I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives, and he who seeks, finds, and to him who knocks, it will be opened. And these words echoed in my mind, and I said, that's right. I can't explain everything, but that's right. But one thing I learned from it is don't give up. There's a, a song, 
And the, uh, the stanzas, the verses of the songs, I'll summarize it, they say this. When the water's too hot, when the street's too hot, when the night is too black, I will carry it. And the chorus, and I think so many of you know the chorus, got any rivers you think are uncrossable? Got any mountains you can't tunnel through? God specializes in things thought impossible. And he can do what no other power can do. So that's why we persist in prayer. That's why we continue to pray for the same thing. Winston Churchill stated, Never give up on something that you can't go a day without thinking. And then I add to it, if you can't go a day without thinking about it, then pray about it instead of worrying about it. There are so many people, so many people, who set such good and healthy and productive goals for their life, only to give up because it's too difficult. Because it means just going over the same thing over and over again. And instead of focusing on their goals and keeping it before them, and asking God to help. They'd rather put it out of their mind and settle for second best or sometimes much worse. But being persistent in prayer, it's like keeping our goals ahead of us and saying, God, this is important to you, this is important to me, and so I'm going to ask you, God, again. And it teaches us to persevere. It teaches us persistence. And understand this. It is not through the power of positive thinking that change comes about. It's through the persistent prayers of the faithful, allowing God to work in our lives. You see, if you want to achieve big goals, you better be ready for it. It's going to take a lot of preparation. So allow God to prepare your heart and your life. And persevere and persist. Paul gave us these words, and they're so well known. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 12. Remember these words when he says, Not that I have already obtained all of this, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. You see, this persistence impacts us. It changes us. It changes our way of thinking. It, it brings us to this point in our life where we say, I'm not giving up. If this is important to God, it's important to me, I'm not giving up on it. It brings us closer to God. It brings us closer in our thinking to God's way of thinking. And it increases our perseverance. There's a number of years ago, another song was written by a woman by the name of Lucy Baba Booth. She wrote this song in 1909, shortly after her husband passed away. Lucy and her husband had worked together in ministry for many years. They had done missionary work, and he fell ill and he passed away. And she wrote these words. And the first verse goes like this. When you feel weakest, dangers surround, Subtle temptation, troubles abound. Nothing seems hopeful, nothing seems glad. All is despairing, everything is sad. Should we leave it at that point? You see, that describes many times our own situation in life. But she didn't leave it at that point. She wrote the words of the refrain, Keep on believing, Jesus is near Keep on believing. There's nothing to fear. Keep on believing. This is the way. Faith in the night as well as the day. 
And then the other two stanzas, let me share them with you. Listen carefully to this. If all were easy, if all were bright, where would the cross be and where the fight? But in the hardness God gives to you chances of proving that you are true. Keep on asking. Keep on knocking. Keep on seeking. And then the last stanza. God is your wisdom. God is your might. God's ever near you, guiding your right. He understands you, knows all you need. Trusting in Him, you'll surely succeed. Keep on believing Jesus is near. Keep on believing there's nothing to fear. Keep on believing this is the way. Faith in the night as well as the day. Did you get the point? Did I learn the lesson back those many years ago about perseverance? Let me tell you this. I wish I say I could say to you this morning, yeah, I got it. But I'm still learning. I'm still learning. Persistence is the willingness to continue to face the challenges that come our way with faith in God. Persistence is so important. Let me explain to this in another illustration. I believe I used this a few years ago, but it really drives home the point. When we moved to Paris, France, we enrolled our children in a semi-private bilingual school. And the objective of the school was different than what we had imagined. And the first year that they spent in school, our children, two, three, four, five nights a week had homework. And we had tutors come home over every weekend. And so they would be busy Saturday and Sunday doing homework and learning. And we would watch as they worked hard and their grades would go up and up and up and we were grateful. And suddenly they would crash right down. And they would come home and they would be stressed and they'd be crying and we'd have the tutors help them and we'd work with them. And their grades would go up and up and up and then they'd come down again. And this repeated over and over again. Gina and I said, well, this isn't working. Our kids are failing. So I phoned up and I made an appointment with the school counselor. We went to see the school counselor. And we told him how concerned we were about our kids and their failing marks. And the school counselor looked at us and she said, let me explain something to you. Things are different here. And we're going, really? And she said, well, from our perspective, your children are doing great. I thought she was off her rocker. But she said, we don't mark them on their grades. We mark them on their effort. And your kids don't give up. They persist. And they keep working harder. And we see that. And that's what we want them to develop. It's this perseverance. And we push them. Now, before we get critical, let's understand a few things. France is about a little bit smaller than the size of Manitoba. Manitoba has about 1.2 million people. France has 67 million people. It's very competitive. The European Union is less than half of Canada and has 750 million people. It's a very competitive environment. And they know that in order to help young people, they have to help them to develop that perseverance. And that was their goal. This persistence was vital to their progress and their livelihood. Thomas Edison stated this, Our greatest weakness lies in giving up. The most certain way to succeed is always to try just one more time. Don't give up. If we don't persist, we won't get what we need. We won't make progress. And we will continue to be disappointed and to struggle. But when we persist, when we don't give up, no matter how hard it is, and when we keep on asking, God comes through. 
Harriet Beecher Stowe stated this, Never give up, for that is just the place and time that the tide will turn. Persistent is a steady, maintained, daily effort. Calvin Coovey stated, Nothing in the world can, come, can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful people with talent. Persist. Persistent gives us a reason to believe. We are persistent with God because we believe in God, because we know He cares for us. Persistence is a learned behavior, and we're still on the learning process. Excuse me. <coughs> and we persist. And we are persistent, and it encourages us to be persistent because we know our audience. We know that God loves us, we know that God cares for us, we know that God believes in us. And a really good Bible verse to remember around God's love for us is 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter. We often say, this is a nice chapter to tell other people how to love. We sometimes forget that this chapter describes God's love for us how much he cares for us, and he believes in us. So let's read it again. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, chapter 13, verse 4. And when I say this, think about God. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not honor other, dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in truth. And again, think about God. Always protects. Always trusts. Always hopes. Always perseveres. It's God who leaves in us. And God wants us to learn to persevere and to believe in ourselves. And so he reminds us again Keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking, keep on, persist, do not give up. And this will build a relationship, a stronger relationship with God.